Good morning, everybody. Thank you so much for joining me today and good afternoon if you're on the East Coast. We'll be talking today about adverse childhood experiences, epigenetics, impacts, and moving towards solutions. My name is Dr. Jasleen Chadwal. I'm a psychiatrist by training, and I serve as the Chief Medical Officer as well as the Director of the Mood Disorders Program at Sierra Tucson. Uh, I additionally serve in the role of Clinical Assistant Professor at the University of Arizona, primarily in the Department of Psychiatry, and as President of the Arizona Psychiatric Society. I'm delighted to be here with all of you. This CE event today is sponsored by Sierra Tucson, which is where I work, as I said earlier. Uh, some housekeeping items. Uh, you will be able to submit Q&A throughout the duration of this presentation. You can use the bottom left corner of your screen where there will be a button to submit those, and all questions will be answered during the last 10 minutes of the program. You will also find a PDF of my presentation under the headshot image located on the left of your screen. For any help during this presentation, please reach out to Melissa Pingara, who is a rock star, and will be able to respond to you. To receive credit, you need to watch the entire program all the way through the end, including the Q&A sections at the end of the presentation. And please do not leave the console. That is very, very important. To continue to stay on the platform, you'll get redirected to an evaluation landing page, and that evaluation is key to getting your CE certificate at the end. On my end, I do not have any financial disclosures other than the ones I mentioned initially. Our objectives today will be to identify adverse childhood experiences, explain the mechanism by which adverse childhood experiences exert longer term negative impacts, and then list solutions to reduce the morbidities of these ACEs. I also come with some personal objectives. I follow a personal philosophy of intentional evolution, which essentially refers to mindfully changing, evolving, and living my life. And today my goal is to reduce stigma when it comes to mental health, increase awareness about mental health as well as adverse childhood experiences, and then building community and connection with you. So thank you for being here and sharing your time with me. It's almost the most precious resource we have. Covering the adverse childhood experiences, the main study that was done, it was a study that was in partnership between the CDC and Kaiser Permanente. And this was called the Adverse Childhood Experiences or the ACE study. It was conducted at Kaiser Permanente in Southern California between 1995 and 97. About 17 to 19,000 HMO members from Southern California from that area around San Diego participated in it. They completed confidential surveys regarding their childhood experiences while they also got a current health exam and got an assessment of current health status and behaviors. So this study, as most of you already know, uh, was a very important and seminal study for the healthcare field. It was one of the studies that really brought to the fore that mental and physical health issues could not really be separated. And in our healthcare industry, we do have great separation sometimes with specialists and other doctors, and then the therapist being on another side. So this was one of the studies that really said, you can't continue to do this, and you need to change how you're approaching childhood development, mental health development, because it's impacting not only physical health, but also mental health. And this it was the study design where they did the first wave of the survey and completed the medical evaluations and then did a second survey and also completed medical evaluations from that. And with the follow-up, they were able to assess, they continue to follow some mortality, morbidity data, looked at outpatient visits, emergency room visits, pharmacy utilization. So there was this ongoing assessment of, hey, what was your history in the past? What did you report in that survey? And then what really is your health status now when you're older? 
The study showed us that adverse childhood experiences are very common and that most people in the U.S. have at least one ACE. And people who have four or more ACEs actually have an elevated risk of adult onset health conditions, such as physical health conditions, including cancer, diabetes, heart disease, as well as what is considered traditionally mental health issues, including addiction, suicide, depression. And in the graphic that you see on your slide, you also see how from conception all the way through life, we can continue to add up different forms of trauma. So there can be historical or generational trauma that we may be born with. There can be some local context. There can be perinatal trauma that comes about when we are during the conception period. And then there can be the ACEs, which are the adverse childhood experiences, which then lead to disrupted neurodevelopment, further impairment in cognitive, social, emotional issues, having high health risk behaviors, disease, disability, loss of social problems, and finally even leading to early death. And when we look at ACEs specifically going into greater detail about these adverse childhood experiences, they come in three big categories. One is abuse, another is neglect, and the third were questions centered around household challenges which could include substance use within the family, mental illness within the family, especially caregivers, separation or divorce, having a member of the household who was incarcerated, and then also domestic violence. And as I was saying earlier, we noticed that cases are pretty common. And when you ask these 10 questions, they're really just 10 questions about a person's growth and development before the age of 18, you start to notice that a large chunk of our population has had adversity earlier on. This becomes very important because we need to always keep in mind when we're working with individuals, whether we were coming from a primary care office perspective or coming from a specialist office perspective or doing therapy, that these traumatic events earlier in life can lead to all those negative impacts the impaired neurodevelopment that we spoke about a minute ago, further impairing immune system and responses, and then leading to chronic health conditions as well as behavioral health disorders. These are some of the areas in which we see adverse childhood experiences causing issues, so mental health, maternal health, infectious disease, risk behaviors, reduced opportunity, increased risk of injury or accidents, and as we all know with the field that we work in, traumatic stress of this kind can lead to a lot of negative impacts, not only in a personal realm, but also in a relational realm, behavioral, professional, et cetera. Continued impacts of early adversity, just in a different graphic. And all of this makes me always think, what does that mean for clinical care? And there has been this discussion about nature versus nurture for so long in the field. And I believe that currently nobody really worries about that. We're not, again, still thinking about nature versus nurture. But what we are often thinking about, and especially within the medical field sometimes, is, well, what came first or what's increasing the second thing? And often what we notice is that we are born with a set of genes right? That's our entire assembly of DNA. There's about 3 billion base pairs. And putting all of that together, that makes each of us unique. That makes me Jasmine and makes you who you are. And when these DNA really code for instructions for proteins that help us carry out uh, our different day-to-day -day bodily mechanisms, our cells know when we're even in embryonic stage, how to grow and develop into different body organs, you know, one cell is going to go ahead and form the heart. The other one knows it's supposed to become a nerve cell. And so this structural thing, which is called our DNA and our genome, is passed to us from our parents. And then also it can sometimes be passed on and often is passed on within our own cells as they divide. So that is something that is definitely nature. That's what we're born with. Some of the impacts that we can have, which is the impact of nurture on our biology 
comes into something called the epigenome. So the epigenome is a combination of chemical compounds and proteins that go ahead and give instructions to your genes that tell the genes whether they should turn on, turn off, and essentially these compounds attach to our DNA strands and mark them. So they mark them and give them direction in terms of what to do next. These epigenomic modifications, which can occur due to nurture, due to how our perinatal period is when we're in our mother's womb, according to how our childhood is, these typically occur for everybody. So it's not like people who have trauma will have epigenetic changes and somebody who doesn't have overt trauma will not. All of us have these epigenetic changes. And these occur as a natural process of development, tissue differentiation. So again, that same thing about with your embryonic cells knowing, hey, I'm supposed to form the heart, I'm supposed to form the nerve cells. Um, however, this can also get altered in response to environmental exposures. So whether our exposures are positive or negative, and so we can really start to see that impact of nurture on our biology. And the great thing about epigenetics and this epigenome is that it can change through a person's lifetime. And for me, that's really the message of hope in this discussion, that once an epigenetic impact has happened, that doesn't mean that that DNA, that genome is marked for life. There are some places where it's hard to change or remedy that mark. However, for the largest population or the greatest amount of epigenetic changes, we do know that those can change throughout a person's lifetime. And this is where that study of epigenetics comes about. So that epigenetics and scientists who are studying epigenetics study how our behaviors and our environment can cause changes that affect how our genes work. And like I was saying earlier, they can turn gene expression on or off. So for myself personally, I have a family history of bipolar disorder. Um, and so for me, if I had certain experiences in my life that are certain higher risk periods in life, that may be a time that if I was carrying genes that increased risk for bipolar disorder, certain environmental influences could turn that gene expression on. And that would mean I would then develop bipolar disorder. However, if I don't have those experiences and I don't have those stressors or other environmental exposures that come about, then I just continue to carry that gene throughout my life and it never really turns on. So epigenetic changes, just to summarize, do not change your DNA sequence. That doesn't mean that if you did a DNA analysis at birth, and then at age 30, that the DNA sequence would be different. More than likely, unless you had some other type of healthcare issue, your DNA would remain the same. And these epigenetic changes would really just change expression of those genes. And those can be reversible, which is really where our work comes in. And epigenetic changes can also change how your body reads the DNA sequence, so almost like how it gets filtered through and gets expressed. So this is my summary of how nature and nurture, even from a biologic perspective, work with each other. And I think it's a bit of a stretch to say this is just the biologic perspective, because when we work within that biopsychosocial realm, we know that the psychological experiences, as well as the social exposures, all impact biology. So there's really no true separation that can be had of those different elements. We'll work through some slides next, uh, talking about types of epigenetic changes. This is very theoretical. This is not something you really need to remember, uh, but it's something that's a nice to know. The main kind of epigenetic changes that we notice, especially in this trauma realm that we'll be talking about, is DNA methylation. DNA methylation is a type of epigenetic change that directly affects the DNA in the genome. So this is not adding a filter as to what you read, but this is really impacting the DNA by attaching methyl groups, which is that tag or mark attached to the DNA. 
these methyl groups can then turn on or turn off those genes. Um, and essentially they do that by further interaction with proteins. And the cells on which these tags are placed, they will remember whether the genes are on or off. So they're super smart. And this methylation can be removed through a process called demethylation, which is where we say that these epigenetic changes can be reversed or changed over the course of our um, lifetime. So methylation often will turn the genes off where they will no longer be expressed and demethylation typically turns the genes on. This is a very simplistic view of it, but that's just one way to remember it. And here is a graphic for it, which you can review later when you're going through the slides once you get them. And it shares both uh, the DNA methylation graphic, as well as it's going to share the graphic for histone modification, which I'll be talking about next. And histone modification is the second most common way of epigenetic change. It affects the DNA indirectly. In histone modification, histones are types of proteins. And so essentially the DNA sort of wraps itself up around proteins um, and these histones. And so it ties it up in such a tight little knot that it, some parts of that genome cannot be read anymore. So essentially, whatever gets really tightly wound up, it sort of closes off some genes and those get turned off because the proteins can't read them anymore. And some of the other genes, uh, which are not wrapped around the histone proteins, get turned on. And I'm using the term protein quite a lot because the histones are protein as well as the compounds that read the DNA can be proteins. Um, so we, we have a lot of protein in our body. And I guess that's why we eat protein in our meals. Uh, and these chemical groups can be added or removed from histones and the wrapping can change a little bit, uh, which is where, again, there can be epigenetic changes that can get reversed over time. And this next graphic really does depict that a little bit clearly. You see the DNA wrapping itself tightly around the histone. Um, and then when you go further down the DNA strand, there's multiple histones that get wrapped up tightly. And so then the DNA becomes inaccessible and the gene gets turned off that's coded on that, that part of the DNA. Looking at studies that talk about relation of ACEs, which was our primary topic, with epigenetics or through the filter of epigenetics. So this was a genome-wide DNA study in which they looked at methylation, DNA methylation levels, and its impact on cortical, cortisol stress reactivity, which is essentially the ability of your body to react to stress by producing stress hormones, uh, following individuals who had childhood trauma. So they had a control group as well as the actual group that was being studied. And they analyzed the relationship between methylation levels and cortisol stress response in individuals with childhood trauma and without childhood trauma. There were three independent samples and they gave those individuals sort of an experimental stress paradigm in which there were some stressors that were added on. They also did a childhood trauma questionnaire to assess historical trauma. So the CTQ was to assess childhood trauma. The experimental stress paradigm was to induce stress at this time to see what the cortisol response would be. And then they studied methylation. And what we noticed, um, and this is a graph, these are graphs from the study, is that in all three different settings, there was a correlation between cortisol stress reactivity and DNA methylation. However, it was really only relevant when you looked at what specific locus and that locus called the KITLG locus was significantly related to cortisol stress reactivity. And the take home point from that was that anybody who had increased levels of childhood trauma in this study showed that they had a reduced stress response. So their body did not generate stress hormones to kind of support them sufficiently. 
And we also noticed that they had increased methylation at this one locus. So that essentially tells us that DNA methylation does play a role in regulation of human stress reactivity and definitely can be one of those reasons why individuals who've gone through significant childhood trauma may not be able to react to stress in a full way and may have reduced resilience. Another study, and I realize these are a bit dense, if you have questions about them later, we can address them. Uh, this study looked again at methylation um, and it assessed the relationship between childhood trauma related methylation alterations and borderline personality disorder. And what it noticed was very intriguing. They noticed that X chromosome, which is the female chromosome essentially, which females have XX and men have XY, that there were specific alterations on that X chromosome. And one of the thoughts by the authors was, hey, this might explain why there's a different gender prevalence in presentation of BPD where there can be an increased female preponderance of individuals with BPD. The other thing it also found was that epigenomic alterations were also seen in genes that were controlling estrogen regulation. So there may be some hormone changes that may play a part or the way the hormones get expressed. And obviously the scope of the study was beyond that to study that in detail, um, but could be another reason why there is a preponderance of women. And then the other piece that the study found was that methylation was also affected in genes that involve neurogenesis, which is creation of new neurons, neuron differentiation, which is your neurons being able to break up and get specialized to help out in different areas, and then also regulation and morphogenesis. Um, the other thing I noticed was that genes involved in immune response processes were also impaired. And for me, as a psychiatrist and somebody who works with mood disorders a lot, I often talk about the immune response and the immune system's role in depression. So this was really intriguing to me that you also saw genetic changes or epigenetic changes in these immune response processes for individuals with childhood trauma, which completely explains why individuals with childhood trauma have higher rates of depression, PTSD, anxiety, and so many other conditions. Um, this study, finally, I think the take-home point from this is that borderline personality disorder diagnosed patients who have a history of trauma, they tended to have even greater levels of methylation than individuals who were diagnosed with borderline personality disorder, but did not have known early life trauma. So it suggested that childhood trauma can cause alterations that increase the likelihood of a presentation of borderline personality disorder and presentation and symptomatology, which is something we as clinicians see I think in our line of work at Sierra Tucson, we often say, you know, yes, you can give a diagnosis of borderline personality disorder. However, most of the time, the common path that it's coming through is trauma. And so it's really response that a person may have developed in response to trauma and not something that we should pathologize too much other than really using the tools and therapies that are available to us. The limitations for this study, which includes the other study I had mentioned earlier too, is that these are small sample sizes, and so it's not replicated on a huge scale, um, but it's definitely very notable given where epigenetics and the study of epigenetics is at this time. Uh, another study about child abuse and epigenetic mechanisms of disease risk, and you're starting to see a pattern here. This one had 96 patients who had a history of childhood abuse and 96 children who did not. Um, the children ranged in age from 5 to 14 years. Main age was around 10, and they were about equal male-female, 42% male, 58% female. They had a mixed racial origin, and in this we noticed that child maltreatment was associated with widespread methylation differences in the entire genome. So there were methylation changes. This one had a unique uh, piece that it looked at. It looked at low methylated, medium methylated, and high methylated. 
um, areas, and it noticed that for, for children who were maltreated in low methylated and medium methylated uh, sites, there was actually a preponderance of children who were maltreated. They, had, they seemed to have more of that. And in highly methylated sites, actually these children had much lower rates of methylation. And so that was something that was intriguing and different about the study than the others. Uh, and may speak to how this early life adversity may have a little bit of a bell-shaped curve or have some sort of limiting factor at which point the way it shows up in the genome is different. I'm not a genetic expert, so I don't want to try to give any further considerations out of that slide. Uh, the other results from this study was that there were a lot of genes that had the methylation changes and ones that coded for cortical development, depression, substance dependence, insulin dependent diabetes mellitus, asthma, and cancer were known to have the most significant changes. And these are all the different conditions we named in one of our initial slides related to the ACEs. So this study really ties that piece together about these epigenetic phenomena really influencing how childhood maltreatment and childhood abuse can show up for us in our bodies. Um, and then this one also showed that there were multiple other networks, which were inflammatory networks and gene regulation networks that were also identified. And on that note, we are noticing in today's world that there is an increase in immune dysfunction and immune dysfunction is on the rise. This is a completely different study that was essentially looking at immune dysfunction. And in some of my other um, presentations, I tend to look at this along with rates of depression, et cetera. And when you look at the immune and brain connection, which that study from about childhood abuse and epigenetic factors also seem to highlight, that if there is greater inflammation, it leads to greater symptoms, not only in the mental health realm, but also the physical health realm. And we noticed that even individuals who are medically healthy and depressed tend to have increased levels of inflammatory markers. So there is some common path through which mental health conditions can show up, even when an individual is not showing physical symptoms through this immune pathway. One more study that I found really intriguing, this one was not done in humans or children, well, I guess children are also humans, but this was done in mice. Uh, and this was looking at how serotonin, which we know regulates glucocorticoid receptor gene transcription or its expression um, can be impacted through epigenetics. In this study, they found that the maternal effect or the role of the mother on the epigenetic state of this glucocorticoid receptor was very important, and it became apparent as quickly as the first week of life. And so if the mother was not able to care for the pup, the mother mouse was not able to care for the pup mouse, then there were negative impacts, whereas if the mother mouse was able to care for the pup, then there was increased synaptic plasticity, which is the ability of your brain to change and develop new pathways, Im improvements in learning and memory, and then also increased synaptic density, so just more ability to have connections in our brain, both in early life and it continued into adulthood for this mouse. And we know that a lot of these studies have shown up to be similar in humans when they are able to be replicated. Obviously, this one has not been, which is why we're talking about the mice. Um, but being mammals and having a lot of similarities, we think that this is going to be pretty important for humans as well. And so we as therapists know the importance of mirroring and taking care of our children early in life. And this really reflects that. This is a quick overview of the stress response system or the HPA axis. And this is just for your own reference since I mentioned that a little bit. And coming to a transition in this presentation where we're going to be done with epigenetics for a little bit. And 
talk about something that's been clear to us all along uh, and that Gabor Mate says so well here. In the real world, there is no nature versus nurture argument. There's only an infinitely complex and moment by moment interaction between genetic and environmental effects. And I like to say every moment, every interaction, everything that we hear or listen to or watch impacts how we change. And for children in their early years of development, it becomes even more important. And it's not about doing everything perfectly but again, about that good enough mother and being able to be good enough as a parent and as a caretaker for our children. And this is something, again, we as clinicians know very well from even the attachment theory, which was put back in the 1960s by John Bowlby. Um, and the attachment theory is something you're all, again, aware of. It has four major attachment styles, secure, insecure, which further goes into avoidant, anxious, and disorganized. Um, and we notice that people are shaped by their prior caregiving experiences in terms of what type of attachment style they may develop. Or again, it's more of a risk. You know, not everybody who has negatively impacted relationships will have a negative impact to their attachment style. So really remembering that we inherently have a lot of resilience as human beings. But again, our job is not to challenge our children with more adversity to see if they will come uh, out on the other side more resilient or not. And our goal is really to give them suitable challenges that they can overcome so that they can develop their resilience. And there's a study about adverse childhood experiences where they use the ACEs questionnaire as well as something called an adult attachment interview, which some of you may be aware of. This was the first time I was reading about that. And they were looking at implications for parent-child relationships. They found that there was an association between the ACE scores and emotional support indicators, as well as adult attachment interview classifications. So when individuals had gone through past trauma or loss, um, it was noticed that if there was a high ACE score, it would often show up in the adult attachment interview with some degree of impairment. And one thing that was seen as an impairment was hallmarks of what they call unresolved responses, where there can be a failure of reality testing and really being able to mentalize the experience. And then another aspect that showed up as an impairment was what they called a cannot classify response, which showed that a person really had a very ambivalent and kind of disparate state of mind. And so the relation that was found in this study was that individuals with those two types of impaired responses typically had a history of complex trauma. And it also showed that if they had those responses, they could predict the most troubling infant and parent relationships. So when they themselves became parents, they had a hard time also with that. Um, the study was done in two different samples. One was in the community and one was a more clinical um, sample. And then these are the assessments like I had mentioned earlier. And this was the overall scoring in terms of levels of exposure, what their scores were, and the number of adult attachment interviews that were judged to be um, either of the two impaired categories. So we see where there's zero exposure to ACEs, it was 13%, whereas once we got to four or more scoring the ACEs, it was 65. Um, my own critique of this study is that we are noticing more and more that people are using ACEs to guide clinical work, and there really hasn't been adequate study done to be able to correlate ACEs with individual work. So if you're doing that in your clinical practice, I will ask you to be very careful because the ACE study or the ACE questionnaire was really developed as a public health measure to inform public health interventions. And so when we start using it for individual patients where we tell them, oh, now your ACE score is high, 
it can lead to stigmatizing as well as some sort of expectation bias where we may expect that because they've had this level of trauma, they will have greater impairment and that is not always true. In this study, they also noticed that piece about resilience we were talking about, that when individuals reported that they very often or often had supportive experiences, emotionally supportive experiences during their life, they were less likely to have the undetermined or cannot classify responses or judgment on their adult attachment interview. Whereas we noticed that individuals who did not have those supportive experiences definitely had a much higher rate um, of the adult attachment interview being judged as undetermined or cannot classify, which is where we're saying they're really not being able to mentalize their world. They're not being able to understand and be able to really respond to their emotional needs appropriately at the time and can also come across as having dissociative experiences or not being connected to reality, which again, those of us who work clinically know that individuals who had pretty severe trauma, especially early in life, can present in that somewhat psychotic state, even though it's not uh, what I as a psychiatrist would consider biologic psychoses. So given all this bad news about things that ACEs can do, what can be done about adverse childhood experiences? Since they have such wide ranging consequences, we do need to look really at prevention strategies because when we're trying to address it on the far end, after these adverse childhood experiences have already occurred, then we're already too late. So prevention strategies can include improving resilience and connection, um, definitely interrupting the cycle of maltreatment in whatever way is possible, and then using public health measures, which is really what the ACEs were meant for, to lower ACEs, and then also screening adults, which may help us identify parents who most likely need clinical support. So before they have their own children, instead of sort of passing it on and having their children have adverse childhood experiences as well, doing that parent behavior training, doing parenting classes, et cetera. Going in more detail into these, um, there are recommendations around how to prevent and work towards prevention strategies. So strengthening economic support for families, as well as promoting social norms that protect against violence and adversity. For strengthening economic support, some recommendations can include strengthening household financial security. So this is where there's a huge intersection in these prevention strategies between mental health and social advocacy. It's really hard to be a fully practicing mental health practitioner without having kind of a secret social activist or a more overt one inside you. Uh, and then also starting to develop more family-friendly work policies so that individuals can care for their children. And we definitely saw it in this last year of the pandemic where it's needing to make our workplaces more friendly so that mothers can continue to work because we know that record number of moms left the workplace or had to reduce their hours when schools shut down and there was no more ability to have caretakers for their children. The second point about promoting social norms that protect against violence and adversity, this can include public education campaigns. So we do have some campaigns about around domestic violence, around sexual violence, also legislative approaches to reduce corporal punishment. So in the US, I think we're much further along than most places. I was born and raised in India and I was just speaking to my friend yesterday about how um, I went to boarding school for some of the years. And in my first boarding school, we would have um, the people who were supposed to take care of us who would subject us to corporal punishment, including using like wooden rulers on our knuckles or making us kneel. And so really working towards policies so that our children don't get corporal punishment, educating families not to do that. Um, there being bystander approaches, which is really that people should not just stand on the side and hope somebody else will uh, 
interrupt, but really take responsibility themselves. And then including men and boys as allies in prevention, uh, since sadly, gender-based violence is still more common than not. Uh, other, the next two, which is prevention strategy three and four, ensure a strong start for children and enhance skills to help parents and youth handle stress, manage emotions, tackle everyday challenges. Details on that, these can include early childhood home visitations, high quality child care, preschool enrichment with family engagement. So really getting our kids starting to name their emotions, start to learn words, learn languages, start to mentalize. There were some wonderful programs out of the UK when mentalization-based therapy were, was developed where they were teaching mentalization in schools as a way of reducing bullying in schools and improving connectedness within the school community. Also, this ties in well with teaching skills, so social emotional learning, teaching our young people about safe dating and healthy relationship skill programs. These are often things that families don't talk about and are also not getting discussed in schools and really trying to figure out which would be the best area. Um, I know in Arizona where I work and practice last year, we passed the mental health parity omnibus bill. It was a huge legislative bill that actually put forth monies for schools so that they could have more robust programs. I think there's always more that can be done, but that was a good first step in terms of actually providing funding for mental health interventions in schools so as to reduce suicide and reduce negative impacts. And then back again to parenting skills, as always. And then five and six, connecting youth to caring adults and activities. And I'm sure you can think of a few different groups and nonprofits that do that. And then the sixth and the last one, which is to intervene to lessen immediate and long-term harms. So connection can include mentoring programs such as big sisters, big brothers, after school programs, even just being involved in something that shows them that there is positive impact to be had in the world. And like we were seeing in that adult attachment interview study, having positive emotional um, experiences that they have early in life or children. And then to intervene to lessen immediate and long-term harms, there can be enhanced primary care in which there can also be greater assessment for any kind of childhood maltreatment or neglect, um, and also being able to pick up through the pediatrician's office if there are any issues that the parents need to address more immediately like if there was a young sibling in the house who was sick, then we can we always see that the other child may get neglected or the parents can be so stressed out that there can be longer term harm from that unintended neglect that can occur at that time. So providing greater support at that time. Also victim-centered services. And this is something we all in each of our uh, little communities needs to work on in a more centered and full way. We know that even now there's a lot of victim shaming that occurs and victim blaming. So being able to not only in our practices, but also make our voices heard in our community and try to change the culture of um, first responder communities and being able to really support young people when they're going through the, any kind of negative experience as well as um, victims of domestic violence because we know that that will then further down impact children in the home. And then treatment to prevent problem behavior, continuing to do family-centered treatment, um, especially early intervention around substance use disorders because that can be one of those things which goes a bit undiscovered when the parents come to the doctor's office or the therapist's office because they may not be used at that time. And sometimes within the clinician community, there can be a little bit of hesitation to just openly asking the question. So these are the main interventions and the ACE study continues at this time. It's continuing to gather data in various states to get more state-specific data so we can figure out more state-specific interventions, legislation, and Medicaid as well as private insurance programs can be held accountable to helping 
not only detect early, but also put in some monies towards public health. And ending on a hopeful note, I don't think of all the misery, but of the beauty that still remains. And I think if Anne Frank in her circumstance can think about hope and can look to beauty, I hope that we too, even though we've spent an hour discussing adverse childhood experiences, that we can keep resilience in our mind and we can make sure that our goals in terms of treatment are always to enhance resilience, help build people up, and really work towards helping them discover the fullest life possible, even if they've had prior adverse experiences. And I did not quote any of the studies in this presentation, but I typically, when I talk about adversity, I also try to bring up slides and studies which show that there is a lot of resilience inbuilt into us and that often we can have even adversity that comes in early life also helps develop resilience. So it's not always something that has to take away, but we have to make sure that the adversity is something that's overcomable. And that's really the goal of thinking about ACEs is to reduce overt trauma and make it so that a child only faces normal or expected type of difficulties that they can overcome and that don't impact them for their entire life. Thank you so much for being with me today. Here are my references. And again, you'll have these slides so you can look at them. And uh, there are some where I put the references directly on the slide. Thank you so much for attending with me today. And then we will move on to our questions pretty soon. Uh, please feel free to reach out to me at my email, which is my first name dot my last name at sierratucson.com. If there are any questions that remain unanswered, and also feel free to connect with me on social media. I'm trying to learn it. So if you're more of an expert, also please give me tips. Um, now we'll move on to the Q&A and I look forward to speaking with you. So starting with our first question and thank you so much for already sending across questions and then you can put some more in this um, platform as well. Uh, so the first question that I have is, how do ACEs affect sibling relationships? I think that's a really great question. Uh, when it comes to the study that I had posted sort of towards the end uh, that shows the negative impact on attachment or at least healthy attachment, uh, we, do, we would expect clinically that it would show up in all types of relationships because I think as clinicians, we know that our attachment style will show up almost everywhere. Uh, so to some degree, that uh, study that I had posted about adverse childhood experiences questionnaire and the adult attachment interview um, would likely be somewhat what shows up in sibling relationships too. The interesting thing about sibling relationships will be that siblings may have grown up in the same home environment. And as clinicians, we also know that sometimes that means because they've had the same exposures, they tend to have sort of similar personality traits. So that nurture plus nurture, nature plus nurture being the same for siblings often. Um, however, we also know that sometimes siblings are treated differently by parents and they also come with their own temperament and their own DNA and biology may be different uh, because we don't share 100% of our genes with our siblings. So in that case, there may be temperamental differences that are seen. But again, looking at it through that attachment lens may be one of the ways um, and really trying to get a sense of what all different um, social and relational impacts that there have been, how their worldview is different. And again, with the ACEs, like we said, you know, it can't be used as much on a one-to-one -one basis. It's more of a population study. So we're not trying to correlate ACEs to personal one-to-one -one type of relationships, but it may be a good way to notice that people who have prior trauma and trying to understand from them what types of trauma it is and getting a little bit of more detail may help you better understand what's going on. Another question about, is there a way to measure epigenetic changes? Wow, that's, um, that is a fascinating question. 
And I would say, I like I had shared earlier, I'm not an expert in genes or genetic studies. However, from what I have done in terms of my own education and uh, research, I, I do not find that there are easy ways to measure epigenetic changes. There are some genetic assays that claim to be able to assess methylation, but that's really not anything that's FDA approved or clinically mainstream. So at this point, the short answer would be no. And the second part of that question is, what is the best resource to learn more about epigenetics? That is a question I could definitely answer. So I would recommend you look at my references. Um, there is um, there is a CDC page which talks about what is epigenetics. Um, so it's cdc.gov forward slash genomics forward slash disease forward slash epigenetics. So if you look in my references, it should be on the second page. Um, another place to just start to get some basic understanding of epigenetics. Um, is there's also a NIEHS page on NIH.gov, uh, which is on the first page of uh, my references sheet. Um, and then another genome.gov, which is a website, so G-N-O-M-E dot G-O-V. That might be another place where you can start to learn a little bit more about the genome and what the genome studies are doing. And they have a couple fact sheets on epigenomics, which may be interesting to people who are looking to dig deeper into this. Um, next question, can you give an example of what causes methylation, like what this would look like if it was played out in real life? Um, that again, I think is a very interesting question and I hope someday we'll be able to answer that on a one-to-one -one basis, but we know that um, the effects of ACEs go through so many different pathophysiological channels. Like we spoke about inflammation, we spoke about this epigenomics, um, and also we know that there can be an element of the person's own temperament and biology and their natural resilience that they're either born with or things that they learn during their childhood in terms of skills or emotional awareness, et cetera. Um, that it's harder to say on a person-to-person -person basis how that would play out. And I would always encourage us to remember that the ACEs is a population study, and as much as it's really tempting to do our patients' ACEs and say, ooh, that means X, Y, Z, we really can't get there at this point um, because we want to look more so at our patient population and in some ways starting to do extra work to support their resilience so that we know that we can undo some of those epigenetic changes if those have occurred for them. Uh, another question, is there a plan to collect more current data since 1997 was the endpoint of the cited study um, and any studies that look at more recent data on prevalence? So there hasn't been that large of a study because at this point, uh, the ACE literature is essentially considered very believable, and so people are not spending money into replicating it the same way. Uh, there are some studies that one can notice out of places like the Scandinavian countries. Uh, some of them have essentially what would amount to um, a centralized healthcare system which gathers data, and so they do some population data analyses based on those studies. Um, so I don't have one specifically to quote, but whoever sent that question, if you want to send that question to me to my email, um, I'm happy to look through my resources and send you something uh, that may answer your question a little bit more directly. But there are a lot of studies on ACEs. So if you go into any sort of academic database and look at that, um, and if you don't have access to that, again, just reach out to me and I will try to at least get you some synopses of that information. Um, next question, can the DNA be changed to reverse prede predetermined effects of trauma in children? Okay, um, I'm trying to understand that question and the way I read it is that the writer was asking if, if maybe there's intergenerational trauma and there's so those effects of trauma or even perinatally or in the womb when the child, child may encounter trauma, if there's ways to change it. And the answer is one, DNA does not change because of trauma. 
it's really just the epigenome. So think about the genome as the walls or structure of the house and think about the epigenome as the paint you put on it or you know maybe even um, something decorative that you put on it. So the essential structure doesn't change of our DNA because of trauma, but it's those added pieces of epigenome, whether something's turned on or not, the room's opened or closed, that type of thing changes. Um, and like I mentioned in the presentation, epigenetic changes can be reversed to a degree. Um, and depending on you know how how often that trauma occurred and how much impact it had and how substantial the epigenetic changes, but there can be a process of starting to do some reversal by helping individuals with building resilience, giving them a nourishing environment, teaching them new skills. So really speaking to the to the concept of neuroplasticity, which is that our brains can continue to change. And similarly, our epigenome also continues to evolve as we learn different things and as our environment becomes more nurturing. So think of children who maybe have been born in a fairly traumatic environment and early on were either removed from that traumatic environment and taken into another family member's um, home, adopted and got a really nourishing environment in that second home. So we would be able to see that some of the changes that could have occurred up front in their epigenome could be changed later. Okay, um, another question of, can you speak to the reporting rates of those illnesses in past decades and if there is an impact on those increases? Ooh, I am trying to figure out where in the presentation that question may have come. Uh, so if the person is listening and you can give me a little bit more context of your question, that would be helpful. Um, I wonder if that, uh, if it could have come from the child abuse and epigenetic mechanisms of disease risk. Um, and at least for that one, uh, we did not say that those the children who, or the people who had child abuse got those conditions. We're saying that the changes in the epigenome that were noticed were associated with genes that code for some of those conditions, so risk for depression, risk for substance dependence. Um, but I'm, I guess if the question was being asked in a different way, please let me know and again, email it to me. Um, the next question, how do you measure meth methylation? Um, I will ask to pass on that question. I'm really not an expert in that. so. I don't feel comfortable answering that question. Um, if you would really like an answer on that, I'm happy to look through and get you that information. Um, the next question, is there a specific treatment model such as, such as EMDR for treating ACEs? Um, there have been studies that uh, specifically look at individuals who have early life trauma or complex trauma and then you know their symptoms. So I tend to, I do a presentation on treatment resistant depression in which we show that EMDR is effective in treating depression in individuals who had prior trauma. So we're not looking at PTSD symptoms. We're truly like assessing depressive symptoms. And we notice that something like EMDR added on to treatment as usual for depression will help improve symptoms in a treatment resistant depressive episode. Uh, but there's not specifically studies with, with ACEs that do just treatment models that I'm aware of. Um, but again, might be worth looking at, see, and I can look for you if you want, since I do have access to an academic database, if there are studies specifically on EMDR for treating ACEs. Um, but usually, again, we have to wait for trauma symptoms to develop or at least know that they've had a traumatic history and then start to process that. Obviously, we shouldn't wait for trauma symptoms to develop if we already know they're struggling in other ways but may not have a diagnosis. Um, next question, as a community provider in vulnerable communities, how do you propose ACEs to be used if not one-to-one -one analysis? Um, thank you for that question. I think that's a piece that I have recently been becoming aware of because like everybody else, the desire as a clinician is to use everything and every tool that's available for clinical intervention. Um, I think the way we can 
use ACEs is really more so from an advocacy perspective to show that there's this there's this repeated pattern in our community of certain types of abuses. So whether that's exposure to you know violence, whether that's exposure to domestic violence in the home, gun violence. Uh, whether that's absence of parents because they're having to work multiple jobs, or it can also be limited parental attunement, uh, which leads to physical, emotional neglect, um, or even, you know, family members who are depressed. So just all those questions that come in the ACEs, that maybe one of the ways to use ACEs is if you are in a community setting, if you collect ACEs for all your patients and your electronic record can give you sort of a summative analysis then that might be something to take to regulatory bodies or your legislators because they usually come and visit our mental health facilities and, you know, they want to show support and to go back and say, look, this is what's happening in our community and we really need monies and intervention to help with that. So it can help inform clinical interventions more from the perspective of saying, okay, there's a lot of domestic violence in our community. There's a lot of alcohol addiction in our community and we need targeted interventions to pick out people who are adults, who are caring for children uh, in homes and start giving them more targeted interventions, start doing some group interventions for them, even encouraging them to engage in treatment because later on, otherwise their children are going to be exposed to ACEs. So we may not be able to change that on a some like one person's exposure so if it's a person who has already been exposed then more so what we can do is our clinical interventions do trauma therapy engage in that way help them build connectedness and also give them the resilient knowledge to know that maybe if they do treatment they can reverse this epigenetic phenomena they can get healthier um, and, and I know that that's sort of a long answer, but that's why I'm very, very big on advocacy. I, you know, I came from a different country and I had to learn advocacy all over again in the U.S. And I really think it's possible, like it seems like a really large task, but when you come down to it, it really is finding your legislator's email and saying, hey, I'm a mental health professional in your community. These are the people I work with. I'm happy to be a resource. And I would really like to tell you what's going on in your community. And that might be at least one way of getting started or using your organization in that context. I was told that I need to end latest by this time. So I'm going to pause now. I know that we have a few more questions that are already here. So if you want to send those to me personally, I'd be happy to answer them as I shared in the slide deck. I am active on social media or trying to be active on social media, and then you have my email address. And I'll let you leave so that you can go get your CE, which is very important too. Thanks so much for spending your uh, morning or early afternoon with me, and I hope I'll catch you on another webinar soon. Bye-bye.